um, I want to welcome you all again to another iteration of Parapsychology Foundation Presents, Book Expo 2015. And as you can see, all of our speakers, we are now on our last speaker of the day, actually, except for Lizette and I in our closing ceremony. So we've kept the best for last. That's the thing. And I want to, I want to apologize in advance. And because I have been messing up the title of your, of the volumes of the book, so I'll correct this as I'm reading it. But I had already uploaded all the, uh, I don't know why I did that. I had it written down and I apologize. So here's the biography. We are going to be hearing from Dr. Edwin C. May. Ed May is the president and founder of the Laboratories for Fundamental Research. Formerly, he was a director in the U.S. government's secret ESP program, popularly known as Stargate. His published works include Memoirs of a Psychic Spy, The Remarkable Life of the U.S. Government Remote Viewer 001. Is that you? That, I thought that was Joe. <laughs> no, I, I work a part for his book. That's all that is. I see. I, so I screwed that up to, honest to God, it's late at night. What can I say? So he's written several articles in nuclear physics, and I know that's you and not Joe, more than 100 papers in the technical journals of parapsychology and 300 technical final reports on ESP to the government. He received his doctorate in experimental nuclear physics from the University of Pittsburgh. I'm going to get this name right. It's a two-volume set. Volume one is History, Controversy, and Research. And yeah, volume two yeah. is Theories of Psy. His, <laughs> I finally got it. His co-editor is Dr. Sonali Bhatmarwa, a research associate with the Laboratories for Fundamental Research. Her published works include Anomalous Cognition, Remote Viewing Research, and Theory that she also co-edited with Ed May. So about this book, Professor Stanley Krippner from Saybrook University, who we all know and love, wrote, most most mainstream scientists and much of the lay public does not take parapsychology seriously. I doubt that many of them will invest the time and the money require, required to acquire and read these two volumes. Perhaps it's just as well as they might suffer cognitive dissonance as they discover the rigor, the care, and the discipline involved in what the editors call sci research. So I'm just going to go on to the next slide for you there, Ed, and we're showing you the cover of Volume 1, and Ed, and that's Sonali. You remember from the Paramook 2016, and this is your guiding question. So I'm going to get out of the way and, and uh, just hold for us. Well, thank you for <laughs> whatever uh, you want to say. Goodbye. No, I should probably add some more stuff in First off, I want to thank uh, the Parapsychology Foundation for hosting this book expo, and I hope there'll be many annual uh, follow-ons to this. So thanks also to uh, Lizette Coley for being so gracious to host this whole thing. But all the technical stuff that Carlos and Nancy have done deserves infinite kudos as far as I'm concerned. My goodness. Uh, I think the most paranormal thing I know that neither of those two people get any sleep whatsoever. So as Chuck Honerton once said so kindly, they are proof positive of survival before bodily death. Okay, <laughs> enough of an introduction. Um, I'm not going to bore you all with all the details of this book, and Nancy and I have discussed it in some detail. There's some very, very interesting backstories, which is uh, probably addresses the issue of what motivated us to go ahead with this project. Actually, we had nothing to do with it to begin with. Crager, uh, which is the academic uh, imprint of ABC Clio, contacted us. They said, hey, would you guys like to edit a book on parapsychology? We said, are you kidding? Of course. <laughs> and then Crager actually sent us a table of contents, which, let me see how the nice way to word this, it basically sucked. So Sonali and I <laughs> said, no, no, no. We have a better table of contents. And we sent it back to them. They said, oh, my God, this is really great. And so between us and Prager, we ended up with this two-volume set. This book, I think, is truly unlike any parapsychologically oriented book, at least that I'm aware of. 
There are some really great books that we, we will all be listening to here, but if you look back to the last 25 years, many of the books try to summarize what the uh, uh, data in parapsychology are, what the areas of, of concern that we should all be dealing with, and so on. And those books are great. They really are. If you want to have a snapshot of what the data are. However, we think this book addresses something different, and that is we wanted to provide something for people who are not familiar with the field, not to bore their pants off of lots of statistics and p-values and effect sizes and all that stuff. We wanted them to grasp a picture, and the most important part of that, what uh, Sonali and I felt, were the fundamentals of ESP. Everybody sort of has their own definition of ESP. Everybody has their own definition of paranormal ranging from survival, field research, and, and uh, auras, and a whole bunch of other things, all of that falls within the basic moniker of what we all like to study. What we have done is to narrow that down very, to a very narrow region where we can look at research in laboratory. And we call that the informational side of side. And the introduction, if you only read one thing in this whole two-volume set, Please read our introduction, because what we try to do is to make it really clear, at least clear to us at any rate, about what the true fundamentals of informational form of science. We put very little effort, in fact, I don't think any, on psychokinesis per se, mind over matter. We wanted to know what the fundamentals are, time, causality, and information. Because precognition fits in that, clairvoyance fits in uh, fits into there, and telepathy, informational form of psi. Well, one of the um, interesting problems, in fact, it was a giant pain in the you-know-what. We have 38 separate uh, contributors to these two volumes. 38 of them. Have you ever tried to sweep fog off the roof or to herd cats? Getting all of these people to get their stuff to us on time uh, was really difficult, but they did. And they eventually did it with horrible threats. We had black helicopters circling over their houses in some cases, but they all produced excellent, excellent work. And we wanted to know what the history, what Carlos and Nancy contributed, was something really important and a different perspective that actually I hadn't thought much before. You know, we all know the history of science research and, you know, the SPR in London and so on, but we wanted to emphasize what impact, what did the history of science impact on parapsychology. Not the history of parapsychology, but the history of science. In other words, when did uh, Fisher's statistics start coming in there? And then Bayesian statistics, how did that affect what was going on? We also have things in this book which I think are very helpful, and that is, what are the Australians doing? What are the Indians and Russians doing? And what are the people in the U.S., what labs and what they're doing? Try to give an overview for someone who has never heard of this area to get some idea. But for me, what is the most astounding part of this book? We have six, count them six, mainstream scientists, one of whom does dabble in parapsychology, but five others that hardly ever, ever have been associated with parapsychology contributed to this. One of those is a guy named Richard Corrick, who's a mainstream philosopher from, uh, from Australia. And what Richard wrote for us, and it just blew me away, he gave a very cogent argument, argument that why precognition does not violate causality. And of what? I've always thought you know, precognition was a problem because it does appear to violate causality. And he gave a very cogent argument that that was the case, that it was not. Another mainstream uh, philo philosopher was a guy named Anand Dayadya. He's Indian in uh, his family of origin, but he was born in Chicago and he jokes with me that he doesn't have any uh, Indian affectation at all. He, he doesn't sound like Optimum Simpsons, which is his favorite statement. And he's a professor of philosophy, uh, soon to get, well, he's got tenure, he's soon to become a full professor at San Jose uh, University down uh, in the Bay Area here at San Francisco. And what he has done, which is just out, uh, just amazing, he's taken a lot of the research that we have uh, from our lab primarily but posted it on his university website with permission of his department chair. So we are beginning to sort of worry uh, or make inroads slightly to the mainstream. So it's two main, mainstream people that are involved in this. 
Another one is uh, a skeptic. We wanted to make, in fact, 40% of volume one by pages is devoted to skepticism. We wanted people to give rational skeptics uh, a view, a, a voice. That was Chris, Chris French and uh, E.J. Lagermaker from the uh, from the Netherlands. Um, and what was fascinating, Jessica Hutchcourt uh, act, act as a foil for those critiques. Those critiques were excellent. They were not ad hominem. They didn't call us idiots and things like that. But uh, what Anand has done is to uh, mainstream this. But the biggest one is a fellow by the name of uh, James H. Fallon, who is a neuroscientist from the University of California at Irvine. Um, he's gotten worldwide acclaim these days to he's a neural anatomist. And what he's been looking at is uh, the, I, I joke about the noodles. He refers to it, the neural anatomy of the brain of psychopathic killers on death row. And he's looking at their genetics. And what happened, uh, you can find him all over YouTube, and he has a book out. What happened was he discovered, long story short, that his brain and his genetics were worse than anybody on death row. He kept, he kept saying, hey, I'm your basic all around nice guy. How come I don't run around killing people and do all kinds of awful stuff? And he goes into some detail. He's world famous for his work in neural anatomy. And I've known him on and off for about a decade and asked him if he'd be willing to write a uh, forward for these two volumes, which he did. So we have this guy coming out of the closet in tremendous support of the research in parapsychology. And I'm sort of paraphrasing. He said, you know, <clears throat> the methodology developed in research parapsychology has informed him how to do better research. Oh my goodness, I was blown away by that. Uh, another mainstream that we have in here then is Bernard Carr. Uh, well, he's not quite a mainstreamer, although he was Stephen Hawking's um, first uh, postdoc. He's a cosmologist, uh, but he has been president of the Society for Psychic Research in London for years. Definitely interested in parapsychology. I've known him on and off for years. And he wrote uh, in our theory section multi dimensions and how that might account for how information gets from tomorrow in Bombay to here and now. That's a huge problem. Um, I think one of the backstories that, that at least I find interesting uh, is, is Volume 2. What we tried to do in Volume 2 was to put as little of our own viewpoint across in the theories. We have about six or seven theories in that particular volume, including uh, dualist theories uh, by um, uh, David Rousseau, who just got his PhD in the study of dualism. Uh, we have most of the other theories are, are physicalists in, in their approach. Uh, uh, Walter von Lukadu, for example, has this, uh, the theory of, of uh, pragmatic information and a lot of other theories. We tried not to, in fact, we did not uh, try to demonstrate what's, where, why we disagree or agree with any good theory. We have our own theory in there. Uh, called uh, Rethinking Extrasensory Perception um, toward a, a uh, neuroscience view of how precognition works. That's not the title, but please forgive me. <laughs> hey, Nancy, I can't remember the title of our own damn theory. But it's been published in, in by uh, Sage. It's online. If someone wants to get the, the link to that, I can give it for free download. If the theory is wrong, that's fine with us. But there's one part of the theory that is absolutely correct. That is, if you're worried about how the information gets from tomorrow in Bombay to California here now, we call that part of the problem the physics domain. In other words, it doesn't matter about the, the recipient, it doesn't matter any aspect of the, of the subject in the experiment. It's a terribly difficult but tractable physics problem. Then, once the information is on board, how it gets there is a huge problem. We call that the neuroscience domain. And what's fascinating about the neuroscience domain, and this is mainly Sonali's work in that area, she has a PhD in psychology with an emphasis in neuropsychology. Uh, what is it? What's important there is what we're proposing, how this works in the brain, and all of the, all the hypotheses we generate in that particular model are eminently testable. So the, the jury is still out, although we're highly confident. What's most interesting to both of us is all the other theories in book one, book two, 
and the other ones we are just becoming aware with, we can point to where in our model that those things happen. Uh, and Jim, uh, Jim Carpenter at, at, at the Ryan Research Center with his marvelous book, uh, was able to demonstrate and happily where to see where his model fits into the overall, uh, overall scheme of things. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, what was, uh, hard to do was to get everybody getting the, their contribution in, in time. Well, working with ABC Clio, uh, they offshore to India actually, uh, putting together the book itself. And we sort of did a lot of, uh, back and forth with them. We had a tremendously difficult copy editing thing. We sent everybody's contribution out for copy editing and then they had to get these forms and the usual bureaucracy associated with trying to edit um, a, a multi, first of all, a multi-volume set as well as one that is, um, involved um, with what we're doing here. Uh, Nan, could you uh, type in for me how, how long I've been going? I meant to start my clock and I didn't. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, um, how extracentric perception has been received? As far as I, as far as I know, it's been going uh, uh, fairly good. Uh, there have been good reviews. You've heard Sam and Christmas, but we've gotten behind the scenes reviews by a lot of people. It was uh, well welcomed on a uh, uh, discussion list many of us belong to, uh, a parent working working a parapsychologist. So I think it's been going on um, reasonably well. Um, I would think, first of all, it's expensive. There's no doubt. It's around 130 something dollars, and that's a lot of money for most people. Uh, I think they just want the Kindle version, oddly enough, just as expensive, which I'm surprised to see. But if you can afford it, I, if you had to just buy one book and you're interested in the research of informational side, the uh, ESP, uh, precognition, uh, clairvoyance, and telepathy, buy this book. It's really worth it. That's not a, a sales pitch on my part because it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a bestseller, but it will provide you a great deal of information. I know quite a number of li uh, libraries now that are carrying this. Um, I just returned from giving the uh, Bill Roman uh, Memorial Lecture at the University of West Georgia. It's in their library now, uh, so a lot of students could benefit from this book. In fact, I think uh, it might even serve well as at least one part as a textbook for courses in parapsychology. So, what's next? That's a big one. We have, Simone and I have a contract from, um, we have a contract from, uh, McFarland Press. And it will be their biggest, uh, book project and our biggest book project. It is to dive, we're calling it the Stargate Archive. Stargate, for those of you who don't know, was the last, uh, nickname of the government's program in extrasensory perception, the spine portion. And <clears throat> we have something over 300, maybe 350 documents, which we are casting into a, a standard format. And right now we're up to six or seven volumes of this immense material. 1.4 million words, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, equations that have to be done camera ready, a lot of, uh, pictures and, and figures that have to go in for camera ready. And, uh, McFarland is saying, oh my god, what are we going to do? It's the biggest project they have. So we're working in a very synergistic way, quite lovely with the people there. In fact, Joe McMonagall and I went down to visit them in North Carolina. It was a lovely day with these people. Uh, it's scheduled to be out <coughs> August next, uh, 2016. Whether we'll meet that or not, I don't know. Uh, a lot of the uh, initial work is done. We're going to have a whole volume devoted to Government reports, not reports generated by the SRI or Stanford, I mean, um, Science Application and National Corporation. These are government documents produced by the CIA, produced by Defense Intelligence Agency, produced by various elements in the Pentagon, and so on. And a large number of memos flying around. And what those memos and documents show, very, very clearly. I don't quite know how to say this, so I say I hope CIA is listening into this, but the CIA just bald-faced lied with regard to both their um, uh, writing in what's called the American Institute of Research Report, 
and live on television in the form of um, uh, Robert Gates, the former director of CIA and former defense uh, uh, secretary of defense. I was on the show office of him on Nightline in 1995, and he said over and over again, there was never a single case where this was used for actionable intelligence. We are going to slaughter that, not by our belief, not by what we think is true, but what the government thought is true. Well, I'll give you two examples. One example is that the CIA shut everything down in 1995, yet the Congress asked the Defense Intelligence Agency to put forward a five-year research plan, which I actually have that research plan that's going to go into this archive. So you have to wonder if it was so terribly not useful, why would the Defense Intelligence Agency want to put together another five-year program? They never actually did, but at least they said they were going to. So that's one thing. The second part, which is really important, Joe McMonagall received what's called the Legion of Merit Award, which is the top award that any intelligence officer can get by the U.S. government for his excellence in producing huge amount of actionable intelligence. Uh, by he named the, uh, the a, alphabet soup, CIA, DIA, uh, FBI, and so on. Uh, and he got an award for doing that. Gee, if it didn't work, why would somebody bother giving him such a award? Misinformation, maybe? No, I'm not at all. Um, this second volume, uh, this volume on uh, uh, the U.S. government part of the, their document will include as many examples of remote viewing spying that we can get, which is now declassified. One example, which it, it just astounds me. I have the, the drawings and what people said, and I have the geographical coordinates, even from data collected by remote viewing in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. I then could use those coordinates and go to Google Earth now and much of what they remote viewed back then is still there. One example is uh, about 30 miles outside of Moscow is an anti-ballistic missile radar site. This radar is in a building shaped like a, a pyramid with the top cut off. Uh, it's about 350 feet on a side and has very uh, visual kind of antennas along these sloping sides of this pyramid. And Turns out that in about three weeks, I'm going, two weeks, I'm going to be in Moscow, and we are gaining access to that site. So we're going to have to come back with all kinds of interesting photographs of that site. But that's just one example of probably a dozen that we will have. The CIA will probably, have, first of all, they'll probably ignore it, I guess. <laughs> but uh, it's important from our point of view with this archive to address scholars 50 years from now to strip away the politics and the, and the fighting and what have you, to go back and forth. So that's basically it. The backstory, I urge you to look at this thing. There are other books. If you go to Amazon and look up my name, Edwin C. May, you'll see a couple of other books there. But this is the one for this, for this story right now. And I'm hoping that you all can uh, ask some questions. That's all I have to say. Nancy, come on back. I'm on. I'm on. Thank you very much, Ed. Okay, guys, the chat box is open if you have any questions. I see people writing. Well, I have to say, Carlos and I were uh, probably among those who had the helicopter hey, circling nice. while we were trying that. to finish up <laughs> the chapter. <laughs> Definitely it was us. Uh, we enjoyed doing that chapter. Not to yeah, mention right. not to eat occasionally because of doing that chapter. <laughs> oh, lots of people are typing. Yeah, I'm looking here also. Okay, Shirley is asking, did you put out a general call for papers to get contributions for the book or did you... And yeah, that's a great question. Um, we had a list of people that we wanted specifically to be there. Both, both of those people are well known. You know, some of the lesser known people are Carlos and Nancy, but we put, slipped them in anyway. 
what we want to do is to pick the top people we can find. Uh, we've got Chris French, who is a skeptic, but a kind one. And E.J. Wagenmaker was an unknown guy to me, although he criticized Ben quite a bit in his work. Uh, we wanted to get the best people we could. And, much to my surprise, we queried a lot of mainstream people who turned us down. But, uh, so the fact that these guys must have had some innate interest. Uh, Anand Vaidya, for example, uh, I've never heard of this area. A little, a little backstory with him. He got so enamored by this data. So I went to India just after the course in January, and before I left, Anand said, hey, this is really great stuff, and I'm giving a talk in front of an American Psychological Association meeting, and I'm going to talk about your work. And I said, no, 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 not a good idea at the APA. Don't do that, please. He said, no, no, this is a bunch of academics, no big problem. Well, the poor guy, <laughs> I got an email from him when I was in India. He said, Ed, you so underestimated the how vicious and mean these people were. <laughs> he was horrified. But I said, then why the hell? Yeah. I mean, now, uh, I had lunch with him about a month ago. Why are you putting our papers on your website at the San Jose State University Department of Philosophy? He said, because it's good work. And I said, but you're trying to become a full professor. This is going to kill your career. He said, no. He's talked to his, his, uh, department chair and he's approved the whole thing. So we are nibbling at, we are nibbling at the mainstream folks. Wonderful. Great, great. Ariane said when you were writing, assembling, researching this volume, was there something you learned that really surprised Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Like, was this the learning process away, for you? Uh, because it's, it's certainly the biggest problem of precognition. I thought it was, in fact, uh, violate causality. Causality means I can't, this pen will not drop in unless and until I open my finger. And so it looks like precognition would violate that. But Richard Corey gave a very cogent argument why it doesn't. And it addresses something interesting. Many of our colleagues in our field are enamored with the word that makes my skin crawl, and that's called non-local information, non-local -lo non consciousness and non-local gathered information. Turns out, in ancient Hindu philosophy, people thought way back when that when you looked at the sun, some aspect of your eyeball flipped across 93 million miles, grabbed the information, brought it back. Well, of course, now we, we know that that's not it. The interesting part of our model here is it's signal-based, like all other sensory systems we know about. And that's really important because I'm a lazy son of a gun, and if I don't have to invent anything new, why not stick with the old stuff until it starts failing? So, in our case, precognition is not actually looking into the future, per se. That information in the physics domain, how it gets from tomorrow and Bombay to here and now, that's a physics problem. But it's local, not local. It's like a, it's like a proton in your, your retina. You just interpret it right here and right now. It's that sort of argument that unburdens us from causality. It's extreme, and that was brand new information for me. Um, Margaret Loveland is asking, what's your sense as to why the government ah, suddenly got No, they weren't standing in buckets of liquid bags. That's another cold piece. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I have a paper in the Journal of Parapsychology which addresses all that in detail, but, uh, but I'll give you three arguments. Number one, is that uh, during the Cold War, when they were flinging money at us, uh, the kind of intelligence they wanted to gather was called strategic intelligence. That means there's some site in the Soviet Union or in the Ukraine, and it's been there for a long time, it's going to be there for a long time more, and we have no idea what the heck's going on in there, so can you help us figure out what's going on? That's a strategic problem. As opposed to a tactical intelligence problem, where the heck is Saddam Hussein going to be in the next 20 minutes? If you balance those two kinds of requirements, ESP sucks at the latter. But it's pretty good at the former, at, in, at, at in, um, in strategic intelligence. So there was a, 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 a reasonably good argument why they wouldn't want us anymore. The second one was, uh, unlike uh, that most people would like, that the, that, the agent, that the agencies loved our work. No, no, no. They were trying to shut us down at every possible turn, 
except, except for a uh, handful of protectors, one of whom I can name now, because in the next issue, the 20th of November, uh, the cover story will be on me. I'm sorry to say, because there's some crappy stuff in there. But there's also some really good story in this in Newsweek. Um, Senator William S. Cohen, former senator from Maine, former, uh, former Secretary of Defense under, under uh, Clinton, was a major supporter of our work. And we have, he was one of the main protectors of keeping the, the enemy away from us and providing funding for us. Uh, when he was, uh, the, what was he? He was the ranking member of the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence while he was still in the Senate. He put in six million dollars to fund our program. It got cut down to two million dollars. And that was supposed to go to the Defense Intelligence Agency and contracting to us. I saw a letter that Cohen wrote, uh, to the three-star commander at DIA saying, you have this guy at DIA didn't want to take this money. He said, well, I don't want the money. And what Cohen wrote to him was, you have 24 hours to show why you are not in contempt of Congress. It's one of those career-ending letters. Wow. Uh, I'd, love, I'd, love to have a, I'd like to have a copy of it. And then thirdly, and finally, this is, I swear to you, it's true, sex and intrigue. I mean, that, that's really what happened. There was a, a congressional staffer who will remain nameless, was having a romantic affair with one of the female remote viewers who will remain nameless. And any time that woman on the project Fort Lee so couldn't get her way, she'd say, I call my friend in the Senate, which she would do. That guy would call the commander of DIA and it would down, <laughs> funnel down the food chain to the poor director of the uh, remote viewing unit at Fort Lee to keep this woman happy. And so I was explaining this to my contact at CIA, and I don't mind naming him, because he gave me his card, it's not classified, the physical chemist by the name of Andy Kirby. So I explained all this to Andy Kirby, and I said, hey, Andy, don't believe me about sex and intrigue here. Uh, it's a big problem. You need to check it out on your own. Well, about two weeks later, Andy called me back, and he said, Ed, you so underestimated this problem. I've been ordered by a higher pay grade than me, never, ever to speak to you again, and he hung up. That was the last I ever heard of. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Gonzalo is asking, do you think the objections against Dive from a quantum mechanics perspective are based on actual theoretical no, I or believe methodological grounds, point. or are they um, I gave a talk at a PA meeting, and I won't repeat it here because it's a little bit colorful. <laughs> a physicist starts commenting about psychology, and I could, you know, I could say, well, I've read some Freud, you know, and now, now I'll tell you about how this works. They say massively stupid stuff, and I, I quoted one of the things at the meeting, and everybody was laughing. I yelled at them and said, hey, why is it that you psychologists start speculating about the nature of physics and make equally stupid remarks you're no longer laughing? I spent the first 10, 12 years of my career immersed in quantum physics because I was doing this with such a work, and we had to, uh, I'm not a quantum theorist by any stretch of the imagination, but please, if you're going to propose quantum mechanics, and we uh, uh, criticize it in volume two of this book, if you're going to propose it, learn something about it, please, <laughs> because there's some really hard problems that are just violated by many of our colleagues, well-meaning as they are. Ariane is wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on what you meant about uh, certain types of remote viewing um, being better than others. So it, she was wanted a more oh, elaboration yeah, yeah, yeah. on okay. strategic uh, One of the strategic tactics. places, which has gotten quite a bit of notoriety, is Joe McMonagle. The uh, National Security Council, which is the advisory arm for the President of the United States uh, on matter security, uh, there was a building in Sverdlovsk, Soviet Union, it's right on the White Sea, quite far north. They knew there was this building, and they did not have any idea what was going on inside the building. They knew a lot of stuff was, because delivery trucks were coming and going, and there was a lot of activity you could see from satellite pictures. So they sent us a photograph from the satellite of the roof of the building. And 
I was put in the double sealed envelope and plopped down in front of Joe McMonagall, and he was said, Tasty work. But the problem of the day is inside this envelope. And then Joe, and it's actually some detail in volume one here, we have a transcript. He went and described in gory detail, I mean exquisite detail, about the construction of a huge submarine that had t- twin hulls, kind of like a catamaran, with an outside hull on top of it, so many missile tubes, a mag- hydromagnetic pulse propulsion device, all kinds of details like that. And the NSC people said, no, no, that can't be, because at the time that building was quite a ways from the sea, about a kilometer. And Joe said, they're going to come and dig a canal and launch the boat. In so many days, he said about 107 days, I don't remember exactly. And in the case, in the space of uh, seven days off of that, he was correct. They did launch what uh, in the West is known as the Typhoon-class submarine. In Russia, it's called the Akura, which means shark. And there's only one of those boats left. And the West was terrified during the Cold War because that boat was undetectable. It was totally, utterly silent, and a tremendous threat. So that's what we mean by tactical intelligence, uh, uh, strategic intelligence. Sometimes the tactical intelligence works, but not very often, uh, during the Iranian hostage crisis in the 70s. Well, they're, they're moving the hostages. Where are they going to move them? Well, sometimes you get information about that, but mostly not. It's not, it's not an all or nothing thing. Sometimes strategic intelligence fails categorically, and sometimes tactical intelligence uh, is really good. But for the most part, it's better for strategic than for, uh, for tactical. Any more questions, anybody? Yeah. Well, let's we'll go have on. A, a few more minutes. I'd like to encourage everybody to go and register for Paramount 2015 if you haven't done that, because we have a talk by Ed and we have another one by Denali as well. Well, I, well, I don't really know. Yeah, yes, I do. I sort of mean this as a bit of an advert. If you type in my name, Edward C. May, into, into Google, I mean into Amazon, you'll find these two books, but two others. One of which I would not recommend to anybody. I, I like to joke, Anomalous Cognition uh, book uh, was given a prestigious, I mean, I, I guess I don't know if you even know this, shortly a month after it was published, it got a major international award by the International Insomniac Association as an insecure. This book, if you read, but as an insecure for insomnia. In other words, if you start as reading this book, you'll dot off really good answer. Okay. Really geeky, full of a whole bunch of stuff no one will give a damn about. It's a lot of arithmetic and fact. But it's at least one collection of all the research. But a book I would recommend is Five Bucks on Kindle. It's really worth it. It's called ESP Wars uh, East and West. That's what it looks like. This is a good read. It's not technical. It talks about what the Russians were doing. There's some very funny bits in there. Uh, I'll tell you one. I'm of the, a Cold War warrior type. That's how old I am. And most of my learning about the Cold War, I got from the novelist Love Them, Robert Love Them, and all those spy novels. And, you know, the KGB is really awful. They come and slit your throat and do all kinds of horrible things. And, yeah, some fraction of them do that. But the KGB, like CIA, is mostly an analytical house. There's 750,000 employees at KGB at the height of the Cold War, and almost all of them were office desk doctors. Hardly any of them were the kinds of spies sneaking around. And one such guy is a co-author on this book. His name is Boris Ratnikov. And he writes a, a, a chapter here for us. It's really funny. You don't think of KGB having a good sense of humor, but Boris says, well, you know, I was a country bumpkin, and when I finally joined the KGB school, my pals took me out for, for an expensive meal in Moscow, and on the menu was dry white wine. And he said, I had no idea what dry white wine was. I figured they were going to give me a glass of water and a pill, you know, put it in the, in the maker one. And then uh, he tells it's just an amazing story. He said his first job at, at, at KGB was co-political officer on a Soviet-era cruise boat. I didn't even know they had pleasure cruise boats. I didn't even know they had them then. 
And so he, he and the president couldn't, and even political officer means don't let anybody defect when they huh. go to port and somewhere in the Mediterranean. So they're out in the Mediterranean, bored out of their gourds. They decide to hold a beauty contest to elect Miss Crew. Okay, fair enough. And Boris Ratnikov, major in the in KGB, dresses up in drag, false breasts, false hips, makeup, everything, false wig, all of that, enters the contest and wins. <laughs> so I said, hey, Boris, are you that cute in the dress? He says, I'm gorgeous oh, in the dress. Uh, <laughs> oh, but dear. you've seen how the other women were, because if you had money in those days, you were pretty spoiled and did it. And then the other women of the boat tried to drown him in the swimming pool. <laughs> and I hope so. Look. <laughs> oh, oh dear. <laughs> well, um, getting back to uh, insomnia, Ariane is clearly not afraid of it because she wanted to wants to know if you were going to put well, together a volume question. three. Um, I have been so fighting with like media to forever. I'd like to put together a volume that asks, that at least addresses the question that almost nobody addresses. And excuse my crude language here, but why should anybody give a shit about ESP? In other words, why do we care? I mean, it's a cruddy way to get information about anything. It, uh, you know, it's statistical, it's hard to nail down, and people are arguing about it and so on. Why waste a career doing it? Why bother? There's some really good answers to that question, by the way, which could fill up volume two very nice. So, you know, I can't get anybody, I can't get anybody to move. That sounds wonderful. That. It'll happen, it'll happen. Cheryl Lee is saying, um, did you see Persinger's work looking at brain coral as a psi functioning? I hope Do so. you see I, it I, as something uh, that will bring skeptics exactly, and proponents uh, to psi culture one. together? I have known him uh, casually for quite some time. He's a very clever fellow. Um, and so I like what he does. The more that we can mainstream this material and take the parapsychologists out of it. Dean Layton and I, uh, I was outgoing president of the Parapsychological Association, and Dean was incoming president. We did something which I don't think has ever been done before. We gave a joint presidential address. We're outgoing and incoming. And at the same, you know, we stood it up. And what we said was something very unpopular. That is, if we parapsychologists do our job right, we'll put ourselves out of business. And yeah. I, I hate to I hate to blow my own horn, but when I was 27 years old, teaching my first introductory parapsychology course, I used to tell them that all the time, that if we do this right, we're gonna, there ain't gonna be no parapsychology. Everybody will be in the discipline that are relevant to the topics that they're working on, and we'll have a multidisciplinary group. And one of my students said to me, um, gee, uh -huh. professor, what are you gonna do? <laughs> I have no idea. Well, good on you. I have that's no idea. Exactly right. And but if, one of the if things we do about it right, that's what we have happens. In terms of uh, uh, dividing up the problem space into the physics domain and the neuroscience domain, physicists who don't give a damn about the brain can worry about a very difficult problem and vice versa. And that's what we're seeing happening now. Very good. Mm -hmm. That's good news. That's good news. Yep. Any more questions, folks? I, I think people are very happy. <laughs> so that's, that's really good. Well, um, since we're at 4.45 and we want to give folks a, a bit of a break before the final session that Lisa and I are going to do on the plans for the 65th anniversary year and what's coming next for the PF, um, We'll, I think we'll close this up, but first I want to show you that in this PowerPoint, if you download it, we have the Prager link as well as the Amazon link for the book. Um, and uh, let's see what else. And only one thing is coming <laughs> coming next, so we've actually got through the whole day. Uh, it was a wonderful talk, Ed, and um, I agree with you completely. If you've only got $120 to spend, don't bother buying a bunch of books. Buy the this, this two-volume set. Because it really covers the the whole 
enchilada from the beginning to the end. Thank you very much for your talk. We'll be in touch soon, obviously, and if you want to come hang around in the session at 5 p.m., definitely do that. And thank you, everybody, for having faith and hope because we got back our our ability uh -huh. to finish up the book Echo, and there was a moment there where we didn't think that was going to happen. So they must be well, they must like be celebrating in higher height of us, and we're definitely you and celebrating and, uh, over here. That, uh, it's just a fabulous thing you guys have done, and really, you know. Uh, I think that the push parapsychology is a multifaceted thing. And you guys have taken the biggest, most important step for education, and this is part of that. Good on you. That's just terrific. Thank you.